The voice of the doors fell silent on July 3rd, 1971. James Douglas Morrison dies from a heart attack in Paris at the age of 27. On July 7th, he is buried in a discreet ceremony at the Père Lachaise Cemetery. But even today, there are too many rumors, fantasies, and mysteries surrounding his death. Los Angeles, 1971. Jim Morrison has the world at his feet. After six groundbreaking years, six albums and over 200 concerts, Morrison is a fabulous angel-faced showman and shaman. A living legend, the Dionysus of rock is also a fragile divinity, tormented by the pressures of celebrity and his own more personal demons. When I first met Jim, I knew he was different. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, uh, to quote him, something's wrong, something's not quite right. Uh, but then at other times he was so vibrant and creative, I, I just thought, my God, he's going to be, you know, live forever and be strong. I watched his gradual kind of disintegration over the years of being a stage performer and I realized as brilliant as he was at it, he, um, he really didn't want to be an actor and it had become an act for him. At the height of their fame, the door suddenly crashed down to earth. The turning point is a concert in Miami in November 1969. In a supercharged atmosphere, Morrison provokes the audience. He is accused of indecent exposure on stage. An arrest warrant is served against him and the risk of prison only too real. Where you have children from nine to 14 years of age being subjected to such obscenities, uh, certainly immediate action is demanded. Well, let me say, Jim did not expose himself, okay? I was on stage. They never proved indecent exposure. No one had a photo of Jim with any of his private parts showing, although there were hundreds of photographs, at least dozens of photographs, shown at the trial. The suit drags on for two years, and the doors are temporarily banned from performing. Jim is reviled in the press and by America's moralists. The icon has the traits of a fallen angel. He is no longer the dynamic Adonis of his early years, and he wants to put his rock star status behind him. In March 1971, Jim makes the decision to leave The Doors. He announces his departure during recording sessions for their final album, L.A. Woman. I can remember, actually, we were, rec we were mixing uh, Riders on the Storm when he was telling us this. The song Riders on the Storm has a, an ominous quality, you know, with the rain and thunder and whatever. And uh, maybe there was uh, something in that song that indicated that something was coming, his death. We were pretty clear that he wasn't coming back. And Jim wasn't the kind of person that you lured back with money or hits or, hey, you could be a star again. He wasn't very interested in that. So it was pretty clear that he'd made a life decision and was going to go pursue his real soul, which was being a writer. On March 11th, Jim Morrison leaves L.A. We were waiting for the plane to be announced, and because we were talking and drinking, and we missed the announcement of the plane, or maybe the announcement wasn't made into the bar area. 
So Jim had to come back the next day to catch the plane for, for Paris. Maybe, maybe subconsciously we didn't want him to go. The next time I saw a trace of Jim was at uh, Père Lachaise, at his grave. Morrison flies into Paris on March 12, 1971. On arriving, he moves into the George V Hotel for a few days, joining Pamela Corson, his girlfriend, who has already been in Paris for three weeks. A few days later, they move into an apartment at 17 Rue Beautreilly in the Marais district. The couple are subletting from a young model, Elizabeth Larivière. I saw a man with great hair. He was charming. He came in and sat down. He didn't say much the first few days, but then we became friends. He was adorable. Pamela and Jim would live here for four months, a haven for the former rock star. At the time, Jim occupied this bedroom overlooking the courtyard and spent much of the daytime here, hoping to escape his worst enemy, alcohol. He had big yellow notebooks, spiral bound, and he would write all the time. He used to go in the dining room where there was a big wooden table. He had books everywhere and notebooks and he would write. Jim writes and explores Paris alone. He loves to stroll along the riverbanks on the Ile de la Cité and in the Marais. He loved this city. He thought it was beautiful and calm and nobody bothered him. He always had this gaping pocket with sheets of paper hanging out. Jim is entranced by Paris, the city of many writers he admires. Charles Baudelaire, Arthur Rimbaud, Oscar Wilde. He spends many a long hour in the Place des Vosges sitting on a park bench. He scribbles in his notebooks and composes his last poems. Paris, the city of light, where his poem, As I Look Back, was penned. As I look back over my life, I'm struck by postcards, ruined snapshots, faded posters of time I can't recall. He told me uh, one morning walking through the hallways in the hotel we were going to breakfast, and he said, well, I guess I just hope to be remembered as a poet when it's all over. Why does my mind circle around you? Why do planets wonder what it would be like to be you? Jim the poet and Morrison the filmmaker. In his baggage he has brought two films made by his friend Frank Lisiandro in Los Angeles. In one of them, Highway, Jim plays the lead, the role of a murderous hitchhiker. A story of rage and destruction, a journey of escape to the big nowhere. One of our plans was that Jim was going to go to Paris and he was going to uh, meet with, uh, uh, as we say in English, Agnes Varda uh, and uh, Jacques Demy and other people in the French film uh, world. And he was going to show them these two films and hope that perhaps they would have a way for us to finish making Highway. Highway remained unfinished, but Jim and Agnes Varda struck up a friendship. In 1970, he had even shown up in the midst of the fairy tale setting of Poe Dan, a world far removed from his own. Il a eu envie de venir voir le tournage. Alors Jacques était déjà à Chambord, moi j'ai pris le train avec Alain et, et Jim, on a pris le train Paris-Orléans, on a loué une voiture à Orléans et on a été au château de Chambord en voiture. Il a assisté au tournage en, en visiteur, en voisin, rien de particulier, il est venu sur la pelouse, j'ai fait un ou deux plans, pas plus. Il venait parce qu'il aimait le travail de Jacques Demy, parce qu'il aimait les parapluies de Cherbourg, parce qu'il aimait mes films aussi, je crois. Et c'était des actes d'amitié simple et de curiosité simple de cinéphile. 
I'd love to stay. I'd love to stay. I'd love to stay. April 1971. Jim has been in France for just a few weeks and has again succumbed to the demon booze. He drinks and hangs out in bars in the Latin Quarter, making chance meetings that help overcome the boredom and solitude. He just literally picked himself up, walked over to us and said, hey, you guys American? <laughs> and uh, mind if I join you type of thing. And we said, hey, sure, come on, pull up a chair. And uh, at first it wasn't obvious that it was Jim Mars. He uh, had, had become namely uh, a bearded poet. Crawl all over me, yeah. Jim downs beer after beer, chain smoking, and invites Phil and his group to jam with him. They pick a blues track that Jim has just recorded, but the gig is soon over. Jim uh, basically uh, had to take a little bit of a break and we found out that uh, he had a really hard time singing. I, I didn't think uh, he would be uh, that sick. I didn't know he had chest problems, which I learned later, because he had been to the Hôpital Américain in Nuit for, uh, for actually coughing up blood. When Jim was in Paris, he went to see a doctor and Catherine remembers that on a telephone call from Paris that Jim made to the office one day, he told her about that he was having a reoccurrence of his asthma. He had uh, asthma seriously as a child, and then he had developed asthma again as an adult. He, he really let go to the extent where uh, he was in the danger zone of uh, killing himself. Jim's doctor advises him to rest. Asthma combined with liquor and tobacco is causing worrying attacks. He leaves Paris for a few weeks and takes to the road, heading to Spain, then Morocco, Tangiers, Marrakesh, and Casablanca. Jim and Pam spend days wandering around the souks in old Medina, fascinated. The sounds and smells were those of Africa, notes Jim in his notebook. He's feeling better and seems to be at peace with himself. On May 3rd, 1971, they return to Paris. Jim and Pamela move into a hotel for a while in the Rue des Beaux-Arts. When he came here, it was primarily to find some peace and quiet. So he spent more time in his room than in the bar or the restaurant. It must be sad that Jim finds an old friend here, Oscar Wilde, who died in this same hotel. A writer, the victim of Puritanism, an exile like himself. What could Jim have to say to Wilde? That he was condemned to join him before long? Perhaps even very soon? It's written on uh, the stationery of Le Hotel, and it's uh, dated uh, the 18th of May, 1971. And Jim says, Dear Frank and Kathy, sorry not to have written sooner. It doesn't seem like I've been here this long. We've been traveling in Spain, Granada was the best, Morocco, southern France, and Corsica. Then he goes on and says, there's an extra room, so please come stay with us. How is everything? Say hello to everyone and try to get over here. Signed, Jim. Try to get over here. I like that. <laughs> I think he was alone in Paris. I think he was by himself. I think he searched out for friendship, and he couldn't find friendship. In the middle of May, Pamela and Jim return to the Rue Beautreilly. They lived their own lives, went out separately. I never saw them together. I didn't feel as if I was living with a couple. Jim continues his walking tour of Paris, perhaps content to wander aimlessly. At the Café de Flore, he comes across a young actress, Zuzu, whom he had met seven years previously. I met him two or three weeks before he died. And uh, I saw him every afternoon up to the end. Pamela apparently organized everything. She was a great planner. 
Oh, it must have suited him. But he let her have her own way. He gave her money. She would say, give me so much, and he would pull out the money. She'd say, I'll come and get you in an hour and a half. And I said, oh, OK, she's doing the shopping. When you say that Pamela was doing the shopping, you mean for drugs? Oh, obviously. And then suddenly, when she came back, everybody split really quickly. That's a sign. I know that sign. got into heroin, you know, even before they went to Paris. So... The only thing I can tell you is that sometimes she would lock herself in her room, and sometimes I would be a bit worried. I'd go and knock, but she'd say it was none of my business. Pamela was seeing a rather odd individual, Jean de Breté, who had been her lover in Los Angeles. He was a well-known figure in drug circles. He was a bourgeois type, with money. There was a whole clique like that. Chic, bourgeois, druggies, who dragged everyone along in their wake. They were very generous. They never said, she's never taken anything, so we won't offer. Just the opposite. Pamela is a junkie, but Jim closes his eyes. He too has his drug of choice, alcohol. Jim is also hooked on the rock and roll circus, the hippest swinging 60s nightclub for rock fans and those who sought artificial paradises. Mick Jagger, Jimi Hendrix, everybody comes to the circus. One night, one of the regulars, Gilles, bumps into Morrison at the club door. He has just been accosted by the bouncers. Gilles drags him into a taxi. He was really in a bad way. I knew he was going to have problems with the bouncers, so I went up to him. I spoke to him and he said that he was Jim Morrison. I asked him where he lived. But because of the state he was in, he couldn't even answer. What state was he in? Ah, he was dead drunk. Gilles takes him to a friend's home in the 17th arrondissement. He literally has to drag Morrison up to the fifth floor. We saw Gilles come in with this guy who could barely stand up. He had this big smile, and he said, what? Hello? And then he fell on the bed. He fell on the bed, but I don't think he said anything. Yes, he said hello. He gave this big smile. I remember that very clearly. Morrison spends the night at Hervé's. The next morning, sober again, Jim invites Hervé and Yvonne to breakfast at the Alexandre Bar in the Rue George V. It is here that he and Hervé, at the time a rock journalist, get acquainted. A rare moment immortalized by a few photos. It was fun, but we'd started drinking before eating, and he'd kicked off with a shivis. And a bottle of shivis later, he wasn't in great shape. Unfortunately, he was an alcoholic, and he was the worst kind of alcoholic, the kind that gets drunk with one drink and then doesn't stop. But I don't remember any of us ever saying, hey, man, you drink too much. None of us said that. We were too young. We didn't understand that at 27 you can die from alcoholism. We didn't know that. Hervé sees Jim on several occasions. Their last meeting takes place on June 11th to see a play by Bob Wilson, Le Regard du Sourd. Morrison is fascinated by the play's macabre tableau. I remember Jim in front of the theater. Very effusive, very enthusiastic, and very inspired. It's 
c'était curieux parce qu'il y avait un côté de lui qui en fait. It was strange because one side of him was still very young. And he had all kinds of projects. Et puis, but there was another side too, where he was all burnt out at the end of his rope. On June 14th, Jim calls the Doors drummer John Densmore. He called me, and I was the last band member to speak to him from Paris. And um, he wanted to know how L.A. Woman was doing our last album. And I told him it was really doing well. And he wanted, to, he was interested in making another record. So he intended to come back. No doubt. On June 16th, Jim goes into a makeshift studio with two pickup musicians and stands up to the microphone. Oh, no, wait a minute. He's pretty drunk. What do you want to play? Anything, anything at all. How about three? No. This is Morrison's final recording. No, do it. Exactly 16 days before his death. How about this one? Ready? Now, listen, I got a favorite. I wrote this myself. Well, I used to know someone fair. She had orange ribbons in her hair. She was such a trip, she was hardly there, but I love her just the same. June 28th, Anne and René, an old friend, takes Jim and Pamela to Chantilly. Then they drive together to the small village of saint leu des serons They have lunch at the Auberge de l'Oise. Without realizing it, Alain René takes one of the final photographs of Jim and Pamela. They seem happy. Friday, July 2nd, 1971. Jim Morrison spends the day with Alain René. A day that René prefers not to talk about. The only report he would make is in an interview with the Italian magazine King, just 20 years after Morrison's death. In it, he describes the star's last day alive. At about one o'clock, they have lunch together in the Place des Vosges. Alan finds Jim tense and depressed, and he coughs constantly. Towards the end of the afternoon, they have a last drink together in the Place de la Bastille. Jim is seized by an attack of hiccups. He tries to control it, throwing his head back and closing his eyes. Alan Runney is worried. I felt like I was looking at a funeral mask, he would say. Alan leaves Jim on the cafe terrace and heads for the metro. As he descends the steps, he turns back for one last look at his friend. He would never see him again. What happened during the evening of July 2nd to 3rd? the last night in Jim Morrison's life. The only official witness is his girlfriend, Pamela Corson. The events of the night, as related by Pamela, are consigned to an official police report. It would constitute the official version. At 9 p.m., according to Pamela, Jim left the Rue Beautreillet and went to dinner in a nearby cafe. At 10 p.m., he came to pick up Pamela and they went to the cinema to see a Raoul Walsh film, Pursued. Oh. At around 1 a.m., still according to Pamela, they returned to the Rue Beautreillet apartment and listened to music till about 2.30. Close to 3.30, Pam was woken up by Jim's noisy breathing. She shook him. Jim woke up. Pamela wanted to call a doctor, but Jim refused. He went into the bathroom and started running a bath. When he was in the bath, my friend called out saying that he was nauseous and he felt sick. He vomited food, then blood, and then a third time with clots of blood. Then he said he felt strange, but he said, I'm not ill, 
go to bed. I fell asleep straight away. I was reassured. At six in the morning, Pamela woke up. Jim was not beside her. She ran into the bathroom and found his lifeless body. She thought he was fooling. And she said, Jim, don't do that. You're frightening me. I thought he'd had a heart attack and was unconscious. I tried to get him out of the bath, but I couldn't. Whatever she did more, she realized Jim was coming. Pamela called her friend and compatriot, Alan Runney. He was with Agnes Varda, who immediately called the fire brigade. Bien sûr, c'est très effrayant. Je parle, c'est réveillé, il était mort dans son bain, c'est pas très rigolo. C'est même une horreur, donc elle avait été très angoissée avec ça. On a appelé les pompiers pour voir si on peut encore le réanimer. At 9.21, an emergency call was patched through the fire brigade in the rue de Sévigny. The reason for the call, someone asphyxiated 17 rue Beautreilly. We didn't even know if it was a man, a woman, or a child. We only knew the reason for the call and the address. It was 9.24 when the firemen arrived on the scene. Pamela opened the door. Her dressing gown was still wet. There was some water in the corridor. The emergency team immediately headed for the bathroom. When we arrived, there was a man, quite well built, stretched out in the bathtub. His head was on this side, tilted backwards, and his arm was resting on the edge of the tub. The water was warm, 30 degrees, and was a bit pinkish, and some blood had flowed from his right nostril, which means that he had lost a little blood, which was a bad sign. So we took the body and carried it to the bedroom that the young woman who was there pointed out. So I had it laid on the floor where we started to pump on his heart. And quite rapidly, we realized that he was dead, certainly dead. So I didn't want to leave him on the floor, so I had him laid out on the bed. Do you know how long he had been dead? I don't know. Just after the fireman, Agnes Varda and Alan Ronnie arrived. Agnes Varda caught a glimpse of Jim's body. Alan Ronnie didn't want to look. At the same moment, the telephone rang. It was Alan René who answered, and I remember being surprised that he'd picked up. We talked a little, and I asked if Jim or Pamela was there. No, they've gone out. But her voice was strange, and her behavior was strange. I remember being really struck by that. At 9.45, Inspector Jacques Monchez showed up and asked a few questions. He would later take Pamela's statement. At 6 p.m., a doctor arrived and examined Jim in just a few minutes. For Max Vassil, the body showed no suspicious signs of trauma or lesions. In his report, he noted, Jim had coronary problems, perhaps aggravated by alcohol abuse, and perhaps a change in the outside temperature followed by a bath could have caused a myocardial infarction. His conclusion was death from a heart attack. Natural causes. He checked to see if there were needle marks in the arms and elsewhere, and there was absolutely no sign of that. That's why there was no autopsy or whatever. There was no doubt concerning the death. It was a heart attack. He saw that he was drinking a lot and was about 50 pounds overweight, but that kind of thing can happen. The death certificate was delivered. Time of death was given as 5 a.m. It was declared in the name of Douglas Morrison, and not James Douglas Morrison, with the aim of being discreet. Uh, 
j'ai fait quelque chose que je suis sûre que Jim voulait, puisque c'était dans l'esprit de sa vie à Paris. Autrement dit, bloquer la nouvelle. And yet, whereas no one was supposed to know, the news reached the door's manager, Bill Siddons, in Los Angeles. The phone rang, and my wife sat bolt upright, like this in bed, and said, Jim's dead. And I went, what? Picked up the phone, and it was Clive Selwood, my label manager in the UK, calling to ask me whether I had heard the reports. He'd been called by three different journalists in France, asking if it was true, and I went, Oh my God, I hope not, but I don't know. So I got up and called the apartment, waited a half an hour, called the apartment again, and I finally got through. <clears throat> I think I got through at about 12, and I uh, had a conversation with Pamela. She was defensive, denying it, and then I got her to, she started to cry a little bit, and admit that it happened, and she said, I don't want any interference, and I just told her, I'm only here to help, not to interfere. I won't make you do anything that you don't want to do. In agreement with Pamela, the group's manager decided to keep quiet. He informed only the doors themselves and a few close friends. Our manager, Bill Sittens, uh, uh, came in and just said he got a phone call that Jim had died. And uh, I kind of uh, sat down and uh, Robbie and I sort of felt like, oh, is it true? It was a horrible moment, obviously, for us. It was just, it came out of the blue. It wasn't that he was sick, that he was in the hospital, that he had an accident. It was just, he was dead. One day he was alive and the next day he was dead, as far as we knew. Bill Siddons arrived in Paris on July 6th, still not knowing what had really happened. He spent the night at the Rue Bautreilly, close to Jim's coffin. I didn't study the casket in great detail and try to figure out whether there was any glue in there, but it didn't look optional to me to open it. I kind of vaguely remember thinking about it and going, well, no, it's too much. And I, again, I didn't have the businessman's uh, mindset of, well, of course I have to see the body to verify that he's dead, because there was just not, not a doubt in my mind that he was dead. Because Bill didn't look in the casket and see Jim, all these rumors flew. I remember Ray saying, well, maybe he's not dead. And I have to admit, if there was anyone as crazy as Jim, uh, he could have faked his own death. On July 6th, Morrison's death had still not been officially announced. The American embassy had been informed and also decided to keep a low profile. Behind the scenes, Agnes Varda and Alan Rennie were dealing with funeral arrangements. Il avait dit une fois qu'il aimerait bien être à la campagne. Alors on a essayé d'avoir un, un cimetière à la campagne et c'est impossible parce qu'il faut être né dans le village, c'est trop compliqué. Alors on est allé là où il y a de la place pour les étrangers qui est le père la chaise évidemment. Et on a fait très vite toutes les démarches possibles, de manière à ce que la nouvelle, j'allais dire la nouvelle d'agence, la nouvelle officielle, ne circule que quand il était enterré. Ils voulaient éviter qu'il y ait autour de la. They wanted to avoid the same media frenzy about Morrison's death as there had been with Hendrix's death the previous year. On July 7th at 9 a.m., Jim Morrison entered his other kingdom, joining the poets and writers he loved. Apollinaire, La Fontaine, Proust, and Oscar Wilde. The tiny procession stopped in the 6th Cemetery Division. Only five people attended the burial. Agnès Fauder, Alain René, Robin, Jim's secretary, Pamela, and Bill Siddons. There was no priest and no tomb. The burial took just eight minutes. Let me see, yeah, it's, it's really, I, I haven't done this, I haven't talked to anybody about this kind of stuff, <clears throat> about, you know, what the experience was like at the, at the burial. I remember the, putting the, pulling the casket out of the little black 
French station wagon, whatever kind of hearse it was. And uh, I remember lowering the casket. And, but I don't, I don't remember the speech. I just remember it being pretty surreal and short and to the point. I was just, wow, I can't believe this is happening. Pam whispered a few verses that Jim had written. Now night arrives with her purple legion. Retire now to your tents and to your dreams. Tomorrow we enter the town of my birth. I want to be ready. On July 9th, six days after Jim's death, Bill Siddons publicly announced the news in Los Angeles. The press published the story the next day. Officially, Jim Morrison died of a heart attack. I saw the death certificate. It's not a very detailed description of how he died, because when we die, I think all of us, our heart stops beating. So it's a kind of a general way of saying you're dead. I had a lot of questions about how Jim died, and uh, I still have a lot of questions about how Jim died. If I had been the, uh, if I'd been 30 at the time, you know, as opposed to 22 or whatever I was, I might have said, Pamela, I need the whole story. I have to know the truth and really tried to force the detail out of her. I didn't want to know. To know what? That Morrison perhaps did not die at home in his bath from a heart attack? Whereas the law of silence still perpetuates the same version? What really happened on the night of July 2nd, 3rd? One disturbing fact is that around 6 a.m., the time when Pamela Corson claims to have found Jim's body at the Rue Baudry apartment, a DJ made a strange announcement at a club called La Bulle. There's a bubble here, because it's called the bubble. And there's a door over there. Two guys walk in, young guys like us. I don't remember their names. They weren't friends, just people I knew. I was playing records, and one of them said to me, someone just told us that Jim Morrison's dead. I was kind of stunned, and my first instinct wasn't to ask him, hey, how do you know that? Where, how? Questions like that. I wasn't a journalist. I just picked up my mic and made the announcement. The news was now out, although no one was supposed to know. The next morning on Sunday, July 4th, a journalist present at La Boule even announced it on Radio Luxembourg. Oh, yes. Uh, rumors were circulating even before it was in the press. Who were the guys who announced that Morrison was dead? The two guys were, they were people I knew. I know they were dealers. Do you think they could have sold the drugs to Morrison? Could they have? Well, who knows? Curiously, on the very day of Jim's death, July 3rd, a wind of panic seems to blow through the Paris dope scene. About four in the morning, a guy I knew well, who was a dealer, came up to me and said, do you know Morrison's dead? And he says, I'm really screwed up because I sold him something. I sold something to his chick and it pisses me off. I hope it wasn't my stuff that killed him. I told him, you know, fine that this kind of thing can happen. Don't feel guilty. You know, he was drinking like a fish and maybe he was mixing. It might not have been your stuff. How can you be sure that you're responsible for his death? Zuzu's confident is not the only dealer to panic. The enigmatic Count Jean de Breté, heroin addict and Pamela's drug buddy, also seems to be afraid of something. He made himself scarce. He realized Paris was pretty heavy at that time. And I'm absolutely certain that he went off to Morocco and that he stayed there. Indeed, as of July 4th, Jean de Breté headed for a family home in Marrakech, along with his girlfriend, Marianne Faithful. He would make some strange confessions to his friends. 
they looked very distraught. And they, they began to tell me and my wife that they had just come from Paris where they had found Jim Morrison dead in the bathtub in his apartment in the Marais. Middle of the night, he said he got a frantic call from Pam saying, Jim is in the bathroom, the door is locked, he's not responding, I'm very afraid, help me. Morrison was turning blue, and was you know, stiff as a board and was obviously dead. There was nothing they could do for him. That freaked them out even more. This version is in complete contradiction to Pamela's statement. She says nothing about having seen Jean de Breté or Marianne Faithful in the Rue Boutry. But how could she benefit from lying? Did she perhaps want to protect herself and Jean de Breté from a police investigation? I think the Count was terrified of staying in Paris because he was a drug addict and they would have wanted to know more about him and they would have liked to find out where the, the drugs came from that killed Jim Morrison. And of course, he said nothing to us about that. Jean de Breté died one year after Morrison from an overdose, taking his secret with him. As for Marianne Faithful, she has constantly refused to say a word about these events. If she says she wasn't there, then she was lying through her teeth the whole time we were together in Marrakesh. Because when she came over to the house a few days later, we talked about it again, and they told the same story the same way to me and my wife. Morrison was an alcoholic and ill. There is no doubt of that. But on the night of July 2nd, 3rd, did he also start using hard drugs, namely heroin? In the article that appeared in King magazine, Alan Rene tells how Pamela admitted to him at the time that she and Jim had sniffed drugs together that very night. Morrison had apparently started using before the day of his death. Pamela was messing around. He criticized her for it. So, uh, but I'm sure he dabbled. Jim Morrison died of an explosive cocktail fragile health, alcohol, and dope. But did he really die in his bath at the Rue Baudry apartment, as the official version claims? Pamela Corson affirms that they spent the night there. This is probably not the case. He was in fact seen at the Rock and Roll Circus, one of his favorite haunts. I was at the foot of the stairs, almost at the bar. And then Jim arrived. And he was in nah, no better shape, no better or worse than usual. He just showed up quite normally, like a guy who'd already had two, three drinks. And we chatted very briefly. How you doing? You want a drink? Yeah, later. And he went to sit down. He arrived alone, but was looking for some friends, I think. Around three o'clock, I didn't see him again. Shortly afterwards, a waiter called Sam Burnett. Someone had been found unconscious in the toilet of the Alcazar. At that time, the Alcazar had an entrance on the Rue Mazarine, and the door to the Rock and Roll Circus was on the Rue de Seine. But the two clubs were connected by a long corridor. At one point, someone came to get me at the bar because someone had locked themselves in the toilets and no one can open the door. So I went along. I was told that a guy had been found there unconscious and that his friends had taken him out via the street door on the Alcazar side, which is the Rue Mazarine. They told me the guy was really wasted to the eyeballs and his friends had taken him away, so I didn't see who it was. I don't know who it was. There was a big question mark about who was behind that toilet door. The question is perhaps not so unanswerable. For Jim Morrison was definitely at the Rock and Roll Circus that night, which totally contradicts Pamela's statement. Jim's presence there on the night of his death is confirmed by further testimony, that of a veritable night owl, a regular customer at the Rock and Roll Circus. This woman has until now kept silent about the drama she claims to have witnessed. I come out of the toilets and I see the cubicle on the right. And I saw this person who at first had like a blackout. And someone said, hey, there's Morrison who's sick. He's ODing. And it's true, I saw Morrison collapsing. He was in a really bad way, and he just collapsed. 
How can you be sure he died from an overdose? Because I know the person who sold it to him. They sold to him directly? Yes, directly. From what I understand, putting the pieces together, I think it was de Breteuil or someone in his entourage who had a contact in Marseille to get good quality heroin. What happened was, the evening the dope arrived, for one reason or another, the others weren't there. Jim was the first to arrive at the rock and roll circus. This guy arrives, he sees Jim and says, I've got what Pam ordered, and he takes the package. He took the package, and in all likelihood, he tested the heroin ordered by Pamela and de Berthe, heroin that was particularly potent. It was 90% pure, whereas usually, from what I've heard in the papers and around, it's maybe 20 or 30%. Imagine someone coming across a bomb like that, and on top of that, doing a load of alcohol because Morrison drank a lot. It must have been like a bomb in his system. It must have blown his head off. And so that night, Nicole saw Jim Morrison when he was taken ill, and when his friends discreetly removed him from the nightclub. It was from here, in my view, because I saw him, that Morrison left, or he was taken out, because I believe he was already dead. What did you see exactly? I saw several people around someone who was completely inert, holding him up, but he was more lying down and standing up. I saw a woman and some men around him, people in dark clothes, I remember. They were well-dressed compared to us, who were dressed like hippies. Who could the people transporting Jim have been? De Breté, Pamela, and other junkie friends? And why, on returning to the Rue Beautreilly, did they give him a bath if he was in such a state? That business with the bath has always surprised me, why he was in a bathtub, until I discovered later that one of the classic techniques with junkies, when someone ODs, is to put them in a cold bath to induce a reaction. Because the most important thing when someone has an overdose is to stop them from falling asleep. So I don't know what the water temperature was when the cops arrived, but it wasn't very important. The water was warm. Yes, but it's easy to add hot water. After Jim's death, the rock and roll circus was the focus for all manner of rumors. Dealers were interrogated by the police, but officially, no one was looking into Morrison's death. A lot of people were scared of the fallout, of the consequences that might result, like the club being closed down or raids on the customers who might have frequented the place, whether they were well known or not. The owner, Sam Burnett, knew about this? Of course. Burnett was pretty discreet afterwards because he didn't want the cops around. He'd already had problems at the rock and roll circus before because there'd been smack going around and the drug squad knew about it. So he had every reason for being as discreet as possible. Was there a blackout over Morrison's death? Obviously. It was clear that at the time it was easy to hush things up. Particularly when the main players in the affair remain silent or disappear like the principal witness, Pamela. Her version of the facts would be unchanged, right up to her death in 1974 from an overdose. She would sit up at night and watch ships come in on the ocean and have visions that he was coming back. It really wasn't a life. It was an existence. She couldn't focus on anything. She couldn't sleep at night. As I told you, she just felt if only she hadn't fallen asleep, maybe something could have been done to save him, but I don't think so. 
Who could have saved Morrison from his descent into hell? Probably no one. Today, his myth is still very much alive. From around the world, fans and admirers flock to pay homage at his gravesite. Twenty years after his death, Jim Morrison's parents had an inscription put on his tombstone in Greek. James Douglas Morrison, faithful to his demons. If I was to say to you, girl, we could 